Now I'll just walk through um, an example of uh, how we can apply some of these uh, patterns and practices of responsible AI in a notebook. So first, uh, like, like you saw, there was a there was a data scientist cycle in the dev environment, and then the ML ops cycle, which was more of the ML engineer or the ML ops engineer. So we will first talk see uh, the data science cycle, where uh, uh, typically the process will be, and this is just a very generalizing, and I, I've taken a very representative data set. I mean, the real world data sets are much more complex, I'm sure. Uh, so you, you load a data set, build a machine learning model, you log some of the metrics, and for auditing, we would use MLflow. So MLflow would be something that would, uh, so I have MLflow running. So MLflow has uh, a tracking server, where you can log your experiments to it. Then I'll show the user interface after when we run the cycle. And then at the end, once we are happy with the model, we'll save the model into a, a data catalog. Now I have used DVC, data version control for the data and model catalog, but uh, we'll see that that doesn't have to be, there are other tools also available which can do that. And uh, just to recall a data catalog, basically DVC is basically something on top of Git where uh, it will let you check in. Uh, I mean, you can manage the version of your data and the actual data set can be in any repository. You can connect it to uh, AWS, you can connect it to Google uh, Cloud or uh, on your local machine. It will maintain the its own uh, uh, versioning on top of Git. So just like Git is good for code versioning, uh, DVC is an extension on Git, which will let you version data set while keeping the actual data set. So you can take a big uh, gigabytes of image data set and maintain the versions in DVC, while the original uh, data set will remain in your uh, Google Drive or uh, AWS uh, S3, uh, you will still be able to manage the versions and access the versions just through a DVC interface. So here, uh, first step would be, uh, I've taken this uh, Kaggle data set, uh, which is for loan prediction. So this is the example that we will uh, take. Uh, so this is, a, so typically uh, you would see just loading Panda from using Pandas loading as a CSV file. So you would want to uh, have some standardization here where you would instead use DVC and uh, select the version of the data set. So in this case, just like Git, I would say head uh, uh, tilde four, and uh, this will be the first version of the data set I'll use. And uh, all I have to do is, uh, and this is the path of the data set. This is the BFSI domain loan approval. And right now my repository is local. It could either be a Git repository or any of the remote repositories. So I'm just going to load the data set. So it went to the uh, DVC, got the data set, and uh, this is how the data set looks like. This is basically for loan approval, uh, where uh, the different loan applicants are there, the gender, the marital status, dependence, education, uh, this, these are different features. And the loan status is a column, which will be yes or no. Uh, yes means the loan, loan was approved, and no means the loan was not approved. And of course, you'll see there are some numerical features also like the income of the applicant, co-applicant income, the loan amount, obviously, and then uh, a bunch of other things uh, that go into this decision making. And now uh, let's look at, uh, I mean, we talked so much about fairness. Let's first look at uh, just the data that we got. We are going to use this data for training. Let's see if there is a bias that exists in the data. So I'll. Uh, uh, this is a uh, basically what the, this code will do is it will take your data set and plot these curves, which will take your target feature, which is your loan status, and it will say how the distribution is. So between males and females, you see almost like a, a stand. I mean, the number of applicants for females is less, but the actual approval rating is seems to be same for both of them. Same thing here for married, unmarried, it seems to be the same. So you can, you can say, okay, this data set uh, should looks unbiased, but uh, how do you quantify it? So you, you, you will use, this uh, AI Fairness 360 library. This is just the um, amount of code that you wrote. And this part of code is just to convert your uh, string features into, into numbers, that's it. So this is the only uh, code that you write. You just import statistical parity difference, give the target variable, and it will calculate the statistical, the, the same metrics that we saw in the IBM AI, AI 360 demo. You will calculate statistical parity difference for gender and uh, disparate impact ratio for the gender. And we see that this seems pretty uh, unbiased. I mean, the ratios are pretty high. Statistical impact ratio should be, the disparate impact ratio should be close to one. 
and statistical parity difference should be minus 0.1 and 0.1 and you can always refer to the ibm ai fairness 360 example to see if this is true so this is a quick test you would do either using ai fairness 360 or using something like a just pure uh, matplotlib and uh, see if the data set is biased now uh, let me before we go to the ml flow part let me just uh, let me change the data set so uh, uh, i have doctored this kaggle data set to introduce some bias so this new version of the data set which is uh, head minus 3 and let me call it version 2 now this data set is something uh, so that is the only change you have to do in dvc because i have checked in this data set the actual files are on my uh, local machine but they will it will automatically repoint your pointers so you are treating this as if it's a git for data so i'm changing the uh, the data set revision and the data set name this is for my internal use and now i load the new data set it's again the same features and uh, on um, on terms of it it looks like it's the exact same data set let's see what the graphs say so here you can see the stark difference here uh, though the number of female applicants were less but the approval rating for females is is uh, distinctly low so the yes for the females the, for the loan status is less while uh, the no no is high while uh, that that trend is not the same for males like you saw earlier same way uh, the, the 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 same way for the the, the no, no trend for the married is uh, also uh, high so or the sorry the un unmarried is uh, is high so that's that's some of the thing that you can see and you will typically see the same thing reflected the same exact code uh, when you do the statistical parity difference and uh, uh, disparate impact ratio you will see the exact same thing reflecting here now you will see the disparate impact ratio has reduced so that uh, there is a bias in the data set definitely bias on gender and uh, there is uh, uh, the negative value the higher negative value indicates there is a bias for gender so this was the first thing so a couple of things one is the dvc uh you just have to change the version of the catalog and just like get it will pull in a new version of a data set and keep in mind this can happen for a big image data set you are training like a 1 gigabyte image data you just change the version it will go and get the same so your code template doesn't change two data scientists can share the same template you just change the uh the uh, data set version and it will take a different data set and then a quick test like this using these matrices you can uh, matrix you can quickly check for bias in the data so this was the first part of the of the demo now let's go to the ml flow part where how do you track this now once you check uh, now let's build a model and log this metric so let me go back to the version 1 of the data set and uh, so now i'll connect to ml flow so this code uh, will occur. so ml flow basically is an experiment tracker so it has a standard way to define your ml experiment you can track your metrics the parameters and even the artifacts like the data sets and the model that is generated you can track it uh, and it will let you do comparison between different experiment runs etc so uh, let me do this uh, i'll connect to the ml flow server i will log this charts for the data distribution i will log the fairness matrices uh, i'm doing a feature engineering here so uh, getting rid of some of the string values and making them into uh, normalizing them into uh, zeros and ones or uh, label encoding them and then uh, i'm logging the uh, i'm getting my uh, confusion matrix and i'm just uh, oh yeah yes please there is one question doctor yeah. there is one question again by claudio cimarel one thing mm -hmm. i am doubtful how we distinguish bias with correct correlation A bias with correct uh, with correct correlation. Yeah, so, yes. Right. So, uh, so if I understand you right, you mean you would? Uh, I mean, if these features are actually correlated to the loan status, I mean, how would you distinguish that? Is is that correct? So yes. Yeah. So you. Uh, so yeah, that's a, that's a, that's an interesting question. So what you could do is. I mean, you could do a correlation uh, test here. I mean, this in this pipeline, I have not done that. But uh, uh, in a, in in the in a in a standardized pipeline, you could do a correlation test and see if uh, these uh, these features get correlated to your loan status features. So there is a correlation matrix that you can build, where you can say that okay, uh, the applicant income is correlated to your loan status. Now, 
this machine learning model will also tell you the same thing uh, i th- uh, i mean that uh, the correlation metrics will help you eliminate some features if you look at your correlation metrics you may say that some features are not playing a role in the loan status then you could uh, uh, you could eliminate those features now the interesting point is uh, uh, does your correlation uh, does gender play a role in loan status now you could build a correlation among that i mean i have not done that that's a very interesting that could be something we could also look at where uh, you could build a correlation matrix and you can uh, see if the gender connects to your loan status and if it does that means there is a direct correlation it's not and the model may be biased yeah that's a good point i i have not done that but uh, i think using a correlation also you could is one way you could find bias uh, what, did, did it answer the question was that uh, or did i miss that okay uh, so uh, yeah so that was about uh, the ml flow and um, the uh, the bias so uh, coming back to ml flow where we were uh, building uh, this matrix uh, the model uh, uh, so we, what we do is here is you create a confusion matrix here and i'll, I'll log that confusion matrix also and uh, one of the things i have added to this pipeline is uh, your shape 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 explanations so i talked about how you uh, once your model is ready now in this case i have built a i built a random forest classifier a base very simple model that will uh, try to make this predictions of your loan status based on the different features and uh, let's see what explanations it generates so here using shape library i can use a tree explainer because random forest is a tree algorithm or an ensemble tree approach so i could use the tree explainer here and pass the uh, data and for the test test data set uh, for which i am getting a uh, pretty decent 86% uh, 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 86% accuracy uh, what uh, i will figure out is okay from the shap scores i can see what are the uh, so so just like you mentioned about a correlation which would be something you would do upfront like in the feature engineering now once the model is ready you want to see what is the what is influencing the model's decision so this is a quick uh, analysis using shap uh, shapley global explanation as well as additive explanations where you can say okay once this model is there these are the factors that the model is uh, taking into account it is giving importance to uh, it is giving importance to credit history property area and education and the loan amount which seems fair i mean this is another way you could also look if the model that you developed got biased so uh, what this is saying is uh, Uh, ethic and these are some of the things you would want to put in front of your ethical ai committee uh, for accountability then okay this is the model that we are releasing in production this is how the shape scores look like or the uh, the explanations look like so does having credit history pro- property area and education and loan amount is this a good uh, f- set to focus on is my model doing the right thing and then um, i can log that and uh, end this run now uh, and th- that is something what you can do in the uh, as part of the audit report now what i'll do is uh, what what ml flow helps you do is do a comparison of the runs so i'll quickly change this data set to the version 2 of the data set and and do these runs it won't take uh, much time so i'll just uh, change it to version 2 we saw that version 2 had this uh, uh, bias and then uh, what i want to show is once we log this i'll show it in an ml flow screen how uh, these now interestingly you see even though the data data set was biased we kind of got the same results we had a pretty good uh, accuracy rate so by having a bias doesn't do uh, anything i mean need not do anything to your accuracy so you may still get the same uh, uh, same results so you may be falsely convinced that hey my data set is good because i'm getting a good uh, good uh, 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 results now one a few ways to know that the model is biased one is like you mentioned uh, you can do a correlation and see if the, the if the gender is playing a role in the loan uh, data set and second is something like once the model is built now uh, let's see how the gen- uh, how the explanations look for this now if you see the features that were important credit history is important fair enough but married as is important and gender male is important so you see the change in the in the importance of features that the, the data set which was biased when you build a model out of it you could see that the uh, the protected attributes like married and gender that started playing a role because these features had bias and now let me just log this uh, 
to ml flow now the uh, what i really wanted to show is i mean one is this that uh, this is why explanations and correlations is important you can identify bias and you can see the performance of your model second part is what i have done here is i have logged both these experiments to ml flow so typically uh, when you get a new data set you may not want to run through like a jupyter notebook like this you will have an ml flow uh, kind of a uh, experiment which will be automated you can actually tie this to your jenkins pipeline so the same jenkins pipeline for your code deployment for ci cd you can do that for ml so once you have a no, new data set you could have an automated without any uh, any data scientist managing it you could uh generate your uh, ml uh, uh, you ge generate your ml model and it will ml flow will generate a, a ui like this for you so let me just refresh that so this is uh, uh, the name of the experiment and these are the, the last two are the ones that we ran so uh, i can and what i can do is i can just compare that so the last run was for data set version 1 oh, sorry the last one was data set version 2 and the one before that which we just ran for data set version 1 and let me just do a comparison now head to head it will tell me uh, the disparate impact ratio for the version 2 was 0.35 while the version 1 was 95 that itself it is telling you that that uh, there exists a bias in version 2 and uh, the accuracy you can see was comparable uh, uh, though the accuracy fell in version 2 you it, there may be a case where version 2 may have a better accuracy so uh, this is how ml flow can help you uh, so once you log the experiment even though you can, you don't need to do in data in uh, jupyter notebook it could be a jenkins job which as uh, uh, like uh, uh, probably amazon's and google's do as new data comes in they would build a model nightly build of ml model but how do you verify that uh, these models are actually fair and the data set is fair so you could go to the ml flow predictions of the model and uh, while you're logging these artifacts you can actually log you don't even need to go to the jupyter notebook you could just go here and uh, see how the The, the data set is performing the same charts that we created we also log those in ml flow so you can have a nice intuitive ui uh, where you can clearly see what what is happening in your model and uh, what uh, and what are the factors that it is getting getting affected and again this is very very customizable so this is just one tool i mean you can do the same thing similar thing in pure flow and you can even write your own api for something like this but you can uh, i mean getting the ml flow artifacts but this is one way of uh, kind of logging your experiments and getting a good visibility of what is happening in your model deployment and then uh, the next so this was about data catalog and checking for fairness the next part is the actual model so you can you can log your uh, machine learning model itself now what i have i've done in my case is i'm logging this to an s3 bucket my ml flow is configured to log to an s3 bucket and now i could have a jenkins pipeline pull from that s3 bucket and deploy it to production so i don't even need to touch it it automatically touch the process it automatically goes and starts deployment in my ml ml ops or i could just uh, download the model right here in ml flow and use that model or i could write a code to pick that model up so it's it's very uh, flexible and the last part here uh, what i want to show is this uh, model catalog so ml flow also has a provision now we uh, uh, saw in the earlier slide that uh, if you want to log this model you could do it right here like you could uh, uh, i i could check this model into dvc so the model file binary file could be treated as an artifact i could log it to dvc and dvc could be my model catalog that is one option to do it the second option would be which is more preferred in the industry is using ml flow model registry where uh, here uh, any new model once i like it i can check it in and this uh, for this loan prediction it will maintain the versions of the model so when i uh, when i tomorrow decide to deploy this in production all i have to do to my jenkins job is tell it take loan prediction 1 version 1 it will take pick this model from ml flow and deploy it and if i see okay my model is uh, running low in accuracy or there's some error i could take version 2 and deploy it so all all you have to do is change the configuration and the ml ops pipeline will uh, deploy these models into production so that's the advantage ml flow gives you it abstracts the uh, model experimentation and the pipeline process for you and lets you uh, push this models to production so this was the first uh, uh, quick uh, demo i wanted to show on uh, putting a, uh, the data scientist hat now in the interest of time i'll just jump to the second demo and i'll come back to the chat questions in a bit sorry about that so the second one uh, what we will look at is we look at from the machine learning or ml ops engineer persona so here uh, what we are looking at the ml ops cycle so once the model is available in ml flow or any model register you choose 
uh, I want to deploy that to an inference uh, to a uh, serving environment. So Seldon is very popular uh, for serving, but there are other options like TensorFlow serving. Uh, I want to feed live data to it. So typically this will be hosted. Seldon lets you host it as a microservice and uh, it will monitor the microservice. Now the advantage of having something like Seldon uh, is it will control the, the invocation of your model. So it will package your model as a microservice, uh, deploy it, and then you can have some patterns for deployment. So you can do an A-B testing. You can say uh, half the traffic of the inference. So when the model is hosted as a REST API, half the traffic goes to one model, one version, other half goes to another version. So you can do an A-B testing right there and then. So Seldon gives you a broker, which lets you do the A-B testing. Uh, it is even more advanced. You can do uh, more uh, uh, multi-arm bandit. Uh, multi-arm bandit is more of a reinforcement learning concept where you can have multiple options. It's more like a, from the uh, slot machines. Uh, the concept came in where if you have like three slot machines, how do you know which one is giving you best reward? So you keep trying those and uh, take your, uh, based on the reward, you select that uh, this is the one I want to play more. So the similar concept, if you have multiple 10 different versions of machine learning models, uh, how do you know which one is better? Because you your test on your training data, one of them may be doing better, but in real world, you don't know. So you may want to do like a multi-arm bandit test on multiple models and that, that can be controlled through Seldon. So it's a very powerful tool. Uh, I mean, have a look at it. There are a lot of interesting patterns that Seldon provides, which definitely will be uh, helpful uh, for, to show how the deployment happens. And then the key aspect, what I wanted to show here is the monitoring of the drift. So data and concept drift we talked about. So once the model is in production, uh, how do we monitor the drift to make sure that the, uh, to understand if the, if the model is not degrading in performance and then what do you do when the model actually degrades? So here, uh, yeah. So let me start this uh, and I'll go a little quick. Again, the same thing. Uh, I'm, I'm choosing, uh, I'm sorry, was there a question? Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm choosing one data set. Uh, now what I'll do here is I'll, I'll do some basic feature engineering. Uh, I'm using this library called PyCaret. I mean, I just wanted to uh, show if, if you have not already used it. Uh, PyCaret is a very good low code uh, library. I mean, it lets you build an ML model uh, with writing minimal amount of code. I mean, uh, it's, very, it's relatively new, but it's very powerful. It has all the best practices using different scikit-learn and other Thing, uh, other libraries uh, embedded into it. So I, I just wanted to share this because uh, here I could I could pick up a model from a registry and deploy this, but I just wanted to show you how, how easy it is to build this model in PyCaret. So just bear with me here. So what I'm doing here is I'm setting up a classification job and I'm just passing my data set, the one that I downloaded from the catalog, telling the known status is this. So it will automatically do all the feature engineering for, for me. That's the advantage of it. It found out these are the features that were there in my data set. These are categorical, these are numerical. This all it did on its own. So this is very powerful. All I have to say is yes or enter. And now it created a uh, feature set for me. Now I can do a comparison. Now you, uh, you must have heard of auto, auto ML, which is very popular where you compare multiple models auto, in an automated manner. So PyCaret lets you do that. This compare models function actually does an auto, auto ML kind of feature. So uh, PyCaret kind of gives you an automatic kind of uh, feature where for this particular data set, uh, it is comparing these different machine learning models. And uh, you can go through the documentation of this. These are different uh, approaches and it is comparing your accuracy, uh, area under the curve, uh, recall, uh, 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 precision F1, et cetera. It will, it will clearly give you a leaderboard, just like you have this Kaggle leaderboards. This will give you a leaderboard telling this is the model that is performing. And I can take one of the models. Let me take this LDA model. So I can take uh, LDA as the selected model and I can do a plot. So just by a single line of command, you don't need to do the matplotlib setup and all. All that is standardized. So it, is, it has some very good boilerplate code. It can take care of all your inter... It, 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 could it takes care of all the low level setup that data scientists often have spend a lot of time on. And it can give you your ROC curve here. So it's with a single line of code and you could change the type of the curve. You could do a precision recall curve or a, a, a confusion matrix and it will give you that. And then uh, just the evaluation of that model, it will tell you for that linear LDA model, what was the accuracy recall, et cetera. It will give you this thing. 
so now this was the model that we built now uh, as i said i didn't have to build a model i could pull it from a registry or the ml flow registry but uh, uh, just wanted to show pi caret so i i took the data set from the catalog build the ml model and now what we'll do is uh, we'll simulate how it will be in production so assume that we have a system that will take pi ml model deploy it as a microservice using something like selden uh, i didn't uh, have selden here so i didn't install it here but it, typically something that you would install on something like kubernetes it's running on top of kubernetes so you could have selden job running on kubernetes and it will let you do the ab testing and all those things so here sorry, what i'll do is sorry, I'll, doctor. Uh, I'll, I'll, there is I, a question <laughs> sorry okay. by marco no, when it fine, comes uh, sorry when it comes to model drift monitoring do you have any suggestions for situations where we don't have a ground truth for future inferences. For example, we recommended something, but we don't have a posteriori label telling us if you got it right or not. Yeah, that's a that's a that's an excellent question. You you yeah, there's no uh, I mean that that's that's a problem we always run into for concept drift that you don't really know how the what is the feedback that is coming in. Um, so. Uh, yeah, um, honestly, I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, I, I have a mechanism. I mean, uh, with uh, something like Selden, uh, when you invoke predict, uh, when you do a predict call to a, a, a microservice, you pass the data and it will give you the prediction. Uh, you can have a feedback call in Selden where you can pass the ground truth. But how do you get the ground truth? That is not, uh, I mean, that is very domain specific. Because for the loan applicant, like I said, it may take three months to approve a loan. So you don't really have that ground truth point at all. So uh, the mechanism is there where you can uh, invoke an API and pass the ground truth and Selden will use that uh, in its pipeline and help use it to calculate the concept drift. But the actual uh, calculation would be dependent on the domain. So I hope, I hope that answered. I mean, um, to some level. Yes, thank you. Okay. Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, so, uh, so what I'm doing here now is I'm just loading a data set and I'm assuming that, uh, uh, that this is something that uh, will be uh, <clears throat> coming from production that I will take this data set and I'll periodically pass this data set to my model. And uh, along with that, uh, by some mechanism, I'll have a ground truth also. So I have some data points with ground truth and using Selden feedback, I'm, I'll provide that uh, uh, the, the the ground truth also to my model, and the model will start calculating concept drift, and I'll, I'll show that. So first, we look for uh, data drift. So I'm using Evidently, which is I, I really like the good interface they have. So what I'll do is I'll uh, take the the data set that was used for training and this new data set, and let me see if there's a data drift. So what Evidently does is uh, it runs uh, some of the statistical tests to check for data drift. So this th this is the just the standard boilerplate code you can write. You just have to pass in your, uh, uh, the two pandas data frames and it will tell you, it will run a KS test for, uh, I believe for uh, numerical data and for categorical, it will do a chi-square testing and it will tell you the p-value of the test. So in this example, it is saying that for gender, property and area and uh, sorry, me uh, and marital status, it is uh, detecting a drift. So the p-value is coming very low. So compared to the training data, and the new data that was provided as a data frame, just the one I loaded, there is a definite data drift in these three features and uh, something like education and self-employed, it doesn't see a data drift. And you can drill down into it. You can see why that uh, for each gender, how much of the data drift is there. So in the new data set, there are more points with the, uh, now I don't know the zeros and ones here, but there are more points with the one gender and the less points with the other gender compared to the reference data set. So this is an indicator of data drift, like the COVID example where the distribution changes. Now your, your model may not deviate because of data drift. And now that is something you would want to check. So in this case, what we would do is we'll uh, uh, take this model. So using pi caret, I will run a predict model on this new data set. And what it will do is it will give me, I mean, this is the new data set. It will give me the uh, the label, these two columns are added by pi caret when I do a predict model. It will just recreate the data set, the, the frame that I gave, and it will create the label and the score. So this is the ground truth, the loan status, which of course, I mean, uh, we, we assume we had. And uh, this is the label that our predict uh, model generated. 
and this is the score the confidence level for this particular score now using these two values uh, we'll use evidently and decide if there is a concept drift now before using evidently uh, what i will do is i'll i'll just do it manually so uh, i will just print a classification report first so just uh, for the <clears throat> so with this new data for your uh, uh, for this new data using the existing model this is the classification report i get so it it does give a pretty good precision recall so though the data had drift the data set had drift the target did not drift so uh, you actually uh, you were able to uh, generate a good precision recall using your existing ml model so you don't really need to retrain the model it is good enough to handle the deviations in the data let's see a different view of it so i'll i'll just plot this uh, uh, the way that a monitoring system would do so assuming over time every 10 points you will calculate a drift and uh, calculate accuracy and plot it so accuracy over time so you see this is a plot of accuracy over time which is something i mean this is the code for it uh, all it is doing is it is for every 10 points it is calculating the accuracy based on the ground truth that was provided in the data frame and you see the accuracy is also very high so this is uh, this model uh, doesn't have a concept drift now the same thing i'm doing in evidently so evidently gives you something called a, a classification report the only problem is it needs two frames now this is something that is uh, probably you need to submit it as a as an enhancement because it always compares one frame to another in this case i just have a single frame so i'm i'm just so ignore the second value so it is giving me all the average precision recall it is giving me the uh just uh, one of this columns it will give me the confusion matrix and it is giving me the f1 score recall and precision on this class which is pretty pretty high <clears throat> and in this case red means good so red is a high score so it's kind of a, a interesting uh, color scheme that they use so uh, in and real quick let me do the same thing on a different data set uh so this is a data set which uh, let, let's see how it looks like and both these data sets are doctored so kind of uh, the 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 drift has been added to them so in this second data set you see the same analysis i do we don't have a drift all the p values are pretty high so the same distribution that is there in your training data was given to this but when you compare this to the ground truth so now when you're doing concept drift like the question you had asked uh, the uh, the ground truth is most important here so now based on the ground truth you can see that this uh, precision and recall has fallen a lot because now the the relationship between your features and your target has changed so even though your data is not drifted uh, your uh, predictions are wrong because your ground truth is different now this is a this is a very difficult to track and like you said it's very difficult to actually implement this i mean this is something we honestly there's no good solution for this i mean if there is a better solution i think there's a lot of scope for a better product around this but uh, this is something we could do is uh, plot this precision recall and uh, see how the ground truth how the values have reduced and the same thing with the accuracy numbers you can now see the accuracy doubling around 0.5 or 0.4% or 0.4 or 40 or 50% so definitely a drastic reduction in accuracy so how we typically do this is in a seldom uh, a seldom would calculate this and show it on prometheus as a chart and over time you could clearly see that the accuracy falling down and you can say okay that's something wrong with this and if there is no data drift that means the relationships have changed and then there is a concept drift and if there is a data drift I mean, that's a different issue then there is a data drift and that is why your model is not uh, performing well it will still need retraining but both cases you will need retraining and you will need to compare compile a sample of data from the uh, from the real world and the last is the just the same thing what we saw earlier doing the same thing in evidently just a classification report you can see the numbers falling here 56% 50% and now it will be much more blue the classification report uh, because of uh, and surprisingly for a single class i mean this is this is odd but um, yeah so now you seeing the numbers fall a lot so there's definitely a, a, a concept drift here so this was just a, an example i just wanted to show the concept here what uh, how the data drift is measured concept drift is measured when you work with tools like seldom you can actually see this in practice you can have a prometheus dashboard showing the drift and uh, uh, see how the that uh, uh, how the drift is varied so that that was it um, just about time uh, so uh, these are some of the things i mean i have some more time uh, and i don't want to cut into your lunch break but if there are some questions i can definitely take them now i'll also look at the chat